once again awarded posthumous champion the vision of a worldwide computer network. So his son Tracy is accepting the award. The award goes to JCR Licklider. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm very happy to be here on behalf of my dad to uh, accept this honor. He would be very happy that there was an internet society, uh, someone shepherding, although that's, that's probably too strong a word, the evolution of the internet, which is probably more unmanageable or predictable than, than shepherding cats. Uh, and I think he would be bemused that there was an Internet Hall of Fame. I'm pretty sure he didn't think of that uh, in his pioneering thoughts. <laughs> also, he would um, say to you um, that you were all wrong and that he never should have been chosen to um, receive this award. Um, he was a fairly humble guy and would sit here, and, and it's been a recurring theme, he would begin naming the names of all the people who really did the work. And he would sort of just say, I was there. Um, and he would list a lot of people. I've been, when he was alive, I've been to some award ceremonies in which he received an award. And it was kind of boring because he sort of disappointed the audience and just listed lots of people. Um, and it's perhaps because his time in government taught him something that he didn't, I don't think, start out knowing, being an engineer scientist. Um, but he kind of got the idea about being politically uh, and socially correct and uh, congratulating everybody else uh, but himself. Uh, my dad um, was, I guess you would say, an out-of-the-box thinker. In fact, there are some people who thought he never was in the box. Uh, <clears throat> and um, as, as serendi I, I think a lot of what he did was serendipitous. Um, he went to Bolt, Baronic and Newman uh, after starting the experimental psychology program at MIT as a person who was known for his experimental psychological work in hearing, audition, and hearing and human factors. And he worked on things like what kinds of signals, his office at BBN had gongs, noisemakers, all kinds of things that would make sounds uh, in the spirit of figuring out what's good to tell a pilot that the plane's on fire. Something that, that would penetrate uh, and be successful in, in letting people know what was going on. In the process, and this is a time when BBN was an acoustics company. They designed Royal, Royal Philharmonic Hall and, and, and the New York uh, facility. And he was lucky to be there when they first got computers. And this utterly transformed him from being a psychologist. He became infatuated. At that time, you were fundamentally working with a personal computer. because. Uh, it was unshareable, and um, and I remember as a kid going in there, particularly on Saturdays, I had a job of rolling up the punched paper tape, putting a rubber band on it, and putting it back on the pegboard. I was paid five cents a day, and it was nice that the BBN vending machine dispensed candy bars for exactly one nickel. Uh, <laughs> but he really was transformed by this experience of being one-on-one -on -one with a computer and had the idea of the potential of, of human augmentation by having a symbiotic relationship with a computer. And that evolved to a very strong belief in uh, what he would call the intergalactic network, uh, which would take the knowledge of humankind and make it freely and openly accessible to everyone in the world. Uh, a somewhat idealistic and optimistic position, perhaps, but one that gained tremendous momentum. And again, as luck would have it, for some reason, somebody thought he should come to the Information Processing Techniques Office at ARPA. And this was giving money to an out-of-the-box 
person who became not only a proselytizer for this vision, but a guy who happened to have cash. Uh, and he was somewhat of a talent spotter, and he would find some smart you know, group in a university and say, oh, sorry, excuse me, sorry. I get carried away here. Um, but, but he had money to give people, all kinds of strange people, all kinds of people who seemed to share uh, his vision. And I think that's where, um, that was the luck of it all. Uh, they could have ap appointed somebody else to IPTO and not had the same result. Maybe a better one, maybe a different one, but it's, it's hard to see that. Um, and, but because he was in this fund, he was an, an evangelist, he was a funder, he would stand up here and say, no, I didn't do it. You know, all these people that were brilliant and, and did it, uh, and let me tell you all their names. And then you'd get bored. Um, but he um, <clears throat> was very happy about how the internet evolved to a point, but he didn't live long enough to see the World Wide Web and to see the dark forces of uh, venture capital and uh, you know, the entertainment industry uh, attempts, all kinds of actors becoming dominant players in the evolution of the internet, more so at the time, anyway, in this period, than technology uh, in some cases. I think at this point, uh, he would be concerned about the attacks on the fundamental notion of taking humankind's knowledge and making it available to everyone. And he would be disturbed by nation state interdiction of their internet. He would be dismayed by government surveillance, um, all of, and, and the partitioning uh, uh, the commercialization and partitioning that made it, that impeded this free flow. Um, and I guess it's up to the succeeding generation of people, the Internet Society and, and its followers, to make sure that we have a good outcome. But in any case, enough said. I, I really appreciate it very much that, uh, that you bestowed this award on him, and thank you very much.